you, Remy. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Florence. Um, I'm going to do a bit more systems thinking, I think, today uh, in my talk as well. So thank you. I'll take the lead there. Uh, first thing I'd like to start with is a bit of good news. And the good news is uh, that the uh, has um, function in CSS is now available in Chrome, Edge, Safari, and Opera. Um, this is actually the fabled parent selector. Um, we've been talking about it for years. Vendors, browser vendors told us uh, it wasn't possible, it wouldn't be performant, but now we've got to this stage where we are living in the future, trying to be topical. Um, on a much more unsavory note, capitalism. And uh, as Remy uh, told you, I've been briefed with talking about this. So good luck, everyone. Uh, you are at the right conference. Um, and uh, so first of all, what is capitalism? Well, that depends very much on who you ask. You could ask preeminent philosopher and revolutionary Karl Marx, who wrote Das Kapital, don't be fooled by the K. Um, or you could ask own the libs underscore 420, a preeminent fuckwit who sold his own kidney to buy a picture of a cartoon monkey. <laughs> you can agonize over that, or you could just look at the name. The clue is in the name. It is capitalism, not tradism, not marketism, not freedomism, and not democracyism, as much as capitalists would like you to think that all of those things are interdependent. Oh, and uh, if you misheard me, it was not crabitalism. I'm not talking about crabitalism. Uh, just brief, there is a book on this. Uh, I'm not going to cover it in this talk. Just briefly, crabitalism is it's like capitalism, but slightly more humane. It's where <laughs> giant marauding crabs uh, devour human flesh as a sort of source of fuel. And uh, if we had a functional opposition in this country, maybe we'd be moving in that direction. But... So capital is just like, thank you, capital is just like um, money, basically, or things which are worth lots of money in large sums. So the, the change in your back pocket isn't capital. Um, and the ism is the active part, right? So what are we doing with the capital? That's the question. Uh, and again, it depends who you ask. You can ask people who are right uh, about the subject, or you can ask people who are wrong. An example of someone who is wrong uh, would be Kemi Badnock, who is the Secretary of State for International Trade. Um, not a lot for them to do, since we've told all of the people it's logistically possible to trade with to fuck off recently. Um, so she instead spends all of her time being either A, hugely transphobic, so fuck her for that, or not understanding economics. And she writes, for decades we have been too focused on how we divide the pie and not enough on growing it. I'm just going to read that again. <laughs> For decades, we've been too focused on how we divide the pie and not enough on growing it. Who here is familiar with pies? <laughs> That's what I'd heard. You <laughs> walk straight into that. Um, so the way it works with pies is you have a pie, right? So once you've made the pie, it's just... That's it. That's the pie. You have one pie of that nature. And what you can do is you can divide that pie up into pieces. And you'd want to do that fairly and equitably, right? So you'd want to maybe give larger pieces to people who, who were more hungry and smaller pieces to people who'd recently eaten. What you can't do, and I can't emphasize this enough, is take one pie <laughs> and magically grow it into a much larger pie to proportionately scale the lattice work would be a geometric nightmare <laughs> just on its own. But the thing is, that fundamentally is the idea, the ideology, the religion of capitalism is that that is actually possible. Um, and if you stand up and you play the Satanist to the God that is this and say, that's not possible, you get labeled a member of the anti-growth coalition which is a term that was used by former Prime Minister Elizabeth Trussrod, to use her full name. Um, and Jamie Oliver, apparently, was recently accused of being a member of the Anti-Growth Coalition. It's sort of reassuring that our current regime doesn't really understand what a leftist is, 
and Jamie Oliver I don't think is one. Um, but yeah, Jamie Oliver, other notable members of the Anti-Growth Coalition are Sir Isaac Newton, who wrote, energy can neither be created nor destroyed. Uh, bear in mind that Sir Isaac Newton is a white man with silly hair, so he stole that idea, essentially, of a non-white person who came up with it hundreds of years before him. Mahavira, who wrote, mass can neither be created nor destroyed. And around the same time, a person called Parmenides wrote, nothing comes from nothing. So for Parmenides fans in the house. <laughs> this is uh, FFConf 2022, is the conf of um, <laughs> circles with dots in them. Uh, <laughs> they'll do some more <laughs> systems thinking now uh, based around that. So in a closed system, and you have so much stuff, you have distributed things. You have, this is its resources, its capital, its whatever, energy, whatever you want to call it. Now, what you can't do is this. You can't spontaneously make more of it appear. From this state, all you can do is go to this state. You redistribute the resources or the capital. Now, if you're living somewhere in the middle of that cluster, you might be thinking to yourself, hey, this capitalism thing really works. <laughs> this is great. Um, things are just growing and everyone's happy. If you're outside of that area, um, then you won't be feeling quite as um, positive about things. And that's why I like this definition. And I don't know who came up with this. It's not a famous writer. I think someone just said it on social media, but I loved it. Uh, this definition of capitalism, which is the privatization of social capital, because it's about taking what's shared, what's distributed, what's naturally occurring, and synthetically placing it into a specific, into the hands of a very few specific people. And it's private in the sense that it's no longer attainable to the larger group. So I can't emphasize this enough, where there is gain, this is systems thinking 101, where there's a gain somewhere, there must be loss somewhere else. Where there's growth somewhere, there must be contraction elsewhere. And where there's contraction, where there's loss, it's called an externality in economic terms, if you want to call it that. An externality is simply a cost not borne by those who create it. It's, it's just obfuscated theft. This is the basic labor theory of uh, value, you take some capital, and we'll talk a little bit in a, in a minute about where this capital comes from, it's mostly inherited, not earned, uh, and you uh, buy some machinery, and you buy some labor, and the labor, what they do, is they add value to what you already had by fashioning things out of it, things that you can sell. So they're not creating something for nothing, they're not breaking the laws of physics, they're not going against Newton and Mahavira or whatever, they're simply reforming things. And then, because they can be sold, you get more capital at the end of it. Now, this is a very key part. Because the labor part, the people who are doing the labor, the only difference between there being a small amount of capital and a large amount of capital, naturally, they're rewarded. Except they're not, of course. That's not how it works at all. They're given a, given a meager wage, which is always always fundamentally, and by definition, less than what they're worth, because if it was what they were worth, there wouldn't be any fucking more capital at the other end, right? That's capitalism, okay? That's how it works. Uh, and it creates externalities. Key thing here is the less you pay your labor, see the more capital you get at the end. So that's called a margin. You get a larger margin that way. And that creates externalities like things that we all have to pay for, and I'm glad to pay for with tax, but it's, we shouldn't have to, is things like income support and, and paying for food banks if they're publicly funded and that kind of thing. We have to fill the gap that was left by the capitalists in terms of being able to make sure that people can live. And this is a very difficult topic to talk about, and I'm not going to talk about it very well probably, but I'm going to do my best. If you're not paying them anything, then that's slavery, okay? So Britney Spears, Britney Spears talks about this in 2002, and she wrote, I may come off quiet, may come off shy, but I feel like talking, feel like dancing when I see this guy. Now, <laughs> you have to read between the lines, but what she's talking about here is um, people are being forcibly put to work without hope of being paid, okay? Which is not the experience. <laughs> Of, of Britney Spears, so I'm not quite sure why she was talking about that. But anyway, um, 
So it's fairly well documented that slavery was the catalyst for mo the modern day. Most of the luxuries and conveniences you experience are built on the bodies of slaves. CSS cascade layers are now coming to um, uh, all the major browsers. This one took me a bit by surprise. Um, I didn't know I needed CSS cascade layers, and suddenly they're really widely supported. And uh, very happy to have them, because what it allows me to do is actually use uh, spe the cascade and specificity um, without making my selectors more complex. Like, I didn't have to bind specificity to the complexity of the selectors. So I can use utility classes, simple class selectors, but at the bottom of the cascade, and they'll still override things. Anyway, that's, that's great, anyway. So back to the capitalism. <laughs> and so you start with your capital, which you only got because you, because you got loads, you en masse got loads of people to work for you for free by threatening violence. You got that, you take labor, then you, uh, that was the seed capital, then you have the labor part, they create products and services here, and then you got more capital. Now, externalities are not always monetary, it's not always just people not getting paid enough or people not getting paid at all. There are emotional, and psychological externalities as well. I think all of us here are reasonably well paid if we're UX designers or, or developers or what have you. But we're placed in a position where we're trying to use our talents, our creativity, our guile to make the world a better place through the work that we're doing. But the people we almost invariably do that for are people who are only interested in making profit. And that is where burnout comes from. You don't have burnout without capitalism. The reason you burn out is because you wanting to do good and to create value and worth comes at odds with the intentions of the people who are employing you. Unless we address the capitalism part here, you're just going to keep burning out over and over <laughs> and over and over again. And just as a side note, I think Burnout Revenge sounds more like a hot sauce than it does a video game. So, it gets interesting with the web, and specifically, Remy wanted me to talk about the web and capitalism. So that was your 101 bit I've already done now. Capitalism is not about creating products and services. That's just one way that they found of creating a profit, okay? Capitalism is just about accumulating more money than you need or deserve. If you could get rid of this part here and go to this, that, that's now you're talking, right? And in many ways, the web and web technologies and technology in general have been able to facilitate, uh, facilitate this for, for capitalists. Um, which brings me to NFTs. Who remembers NFTs? <laughs> Quite the flash in the pan. I bought an NFT. Uh, <laughs> And I'm going to show it to you. This is my NFT here. This is, <laughs> this is uh, it combines my two heroes, SpongeBob SquarePants and KD Lang. Um, it's KD Lang's face on SpongeBob SquarePants' face. Paid $135,000 for that. Um, there are only two types of NFT. There are shit NFTs because they were created by some sort of rubbish algorithm or stolen NFTs, just uh, artworks that have just literally been ripped off real artists and then uh, put on a blockchain somewhere. I've maximized the value of my portfolio by going for an NFT that is both shit and stolen. Um, so this is the blockchain. It's obviously not exactly how the blockchain looks. Um, and there will be an entry on this blockchain which says that I own this NFT, right? Um, it's kind of like having a receipt uh, that says you have bought this in a way that distributed among the blockchain, it's kind of irrefutable. It's a form of proof, or so they say. It's not like a normal receipt where I get any consumer rights um, over copyright usage storage or anything like that because um, blockchain kind of exists outside of those traditional systems and laws governing property, etc. So it really is just a what a bragging right, if you like. And I can't stress this enough, the NFT itself almost invariably doesn't live in the blockchain where it says I own it. Because, and this is Eric Kuhn, who's one of the um, people who created NFT, um, 
they note that the technology is so terrible and inefficient that to do that, it would cost about $40 per kilobyte per transaction to, you know, to like base 64 encode an NFT into the chain itself. So instead, it links out to the NFT, which will be hosted somewhere else on a different web page. And I don't have control over the storage of that NFT. And there's two things here. First of all, that uses a traditional web technology. That's web fucking zero, not web three. It's just a URI, right? That's one of your foundational parts of the web. But also, because I don't have any power over the storage, and he notes this in the, in the um, what's it called, the, uh, the specification for the Ethereum blockchain, the URI may be mutable, i.e. it changes from time to time. Great, so I've bought this thing for $135,000 and tomorrow it might be something else because someone just puts something else there or just takes it down. In my case, what happened is it was replaced with this picture <laughs> of Patrick Starr sitting on SpongeBob's uh, face in some sort of, well, let's call it consensual act. <laughs> now, there's good and bad news here for me. The good news is, I don't actually own this, it's bullshit. There's, there's, no, there's no real ownership with NFT anyway. Um, but the bad news is, among people who actually believe in the blockchain and hold stock in it, there is irrefutable proof that I bought it. <laughs> so, not happy about that. Accent color, CSS property. Um, it's a sort of limited way to style your form elements uh, in a sort of responsible way. You don't have to rely on CSS hacks anymore. You can add a bit of color, add a bit of branding to your forms. Uh, available in, again, another one which just come out of nowhere for me is something that I've been waiting for for years and suddenly it's here. I do feel like we are living in the future, so to speak. Anyway, back to capitalism. Capital plus labor equals more capital. This middle bit, get rid of that, that's inefficient. Instead, we'll have symbolic ownership ratified by proof of work, AKA bullshit. And the proof of work thing is really, oh, oh sorry, the, the externality I should say is accelerated environmental collapse as you're all aware of. Proof of work is a really weird concept to me because traditional capitalism, the side effect would be that you would, um, from doing something like fracking say, you're actually getting value, you're getting something at least um, from the earth, even though you're doing it irresponsibly and in a way that has horrendous um, repercussions, you're actually um, retrieving something that you can then use. Whereas this is, well, it's just a picture or it's, just, it's not something that uh, has any use at all, but you try and make it seem like it does, it, it, hmm, yeah, it makes it seem like it is worth something by destroying the planet sort of symbolically. So we're just ruining things in order to make it look like we've done some work, which is just bizarre. And when you think about it, this was a much more efficient way of just saying to people, I've got n no fucking taste and too much fucking money, was this app, if you remember it, on the App Store. It was just called I Am Rich. It didn't do anything, and it cost $1,000. And you just, I mean, it's a much more efficient way of you know, of, um, of boasting that you, you shouldn't have as much money as you have. So I, th I thought that solved the problem better. Anyway, we're, we're now talking about post-Fordism. We're in the realm of post-Fordism. So this is where we go. We're moving away from actually creating things, creating services, creating products. And we're going into the realm of just tech bullshit, basically. Just obfuscated ways of pretending things are valuable. I actually um, made a video recently, um, and I, in it I said that NFTs only had a transactional value. They're only worth something because people agree that that's what they're going to pay for it. And someone replied and said, if an NFT is just a transaction, then so is your house and your car. And I don't know how to explain to someone who's so far gone into believing in this kind of late stage of capitalism that you can't travel from A to B in a picture of Patrick Starr sitting on SpongeBob's face and engaging in analingus. <laughs> and you can't, you can't get shelter and warmth from a picture of, I don't know, Squidward biffing one off. 
So this is how it's been. This is, we're just trapped in this cycle now where we're just going through all this all the time. So in 2002, we put big prices on essentially worthless websites. That was the 2002.com crash. In 2008, we put big prices on shitty mortgages, which we repackaged to look like they were worth something. That was the 2008 financial crash. And now worthless, legally non-binding receipts for shit stolen artworks. We're, we're pretending that they're worth something. Inevitably, that creates a bubble because you're not going to sell your SpongeBob porn for more than you bought it for. It's just as simple as that. But the irony and the sad thing is that in all cases, this will actually lead to people losing their real possessions uh, that they actually do depend on. Like, th it comes back to reality. Not for this guy, though. Troy Ozinov, who, uh, there's not a real name, obviously. Um, instead of spending $300,000 on a house in Miami, they instead spent just under that $290,000 on a house in the metaverse. That's a not real house in a not real place. Now, you may think that that's stupid, right? Like, what an idiot. No, because you can't make him homeless because he's made himself homeless already. <laughs> right, what will be the next bubble? What will be the next crash? Because now we're locked in this cycle and we've given up on reality. We're in the... I studied the humanities and I was warned about postmodernism and how everything would become disconnected and things wouldn't have any meaning any for, anymore. And like, I, we're living through that, right? And capitalism is kind of churning that away. The next bubble or the next crash, well, I'll give you a clue. It involves advertising technology. So advertising, not to put too fine a point on it, has ruined the web. And it is something that the, the web, working with the web and, and web technology in general has been such a big part of my life. And now it's something that I hate and I resent. And it's mostly because of ad tech. Um, so using the web is just hateful now. But also working on it because, again, going back to the burnout, thing you know you're, you're trying to make your product accessible and performant and then someone in your organization is going to come along and go yeah but let, now let's stick google tag manager in it or let's do you know that kind of thing and you're going to end up in a place where you're just ruining the thing that you've spent all of your hard work trying to make like a good thing right so every aspect of it is shit but the thing that we don't talk about and this is really key is that it doesn't even fucking work it doesn't work. It literally doesn't work at all. Nobody makes money at all. No, nobody who advertises through these platforms makes any money. It, doesn't, it just doesn't work. Like, There's so much research on this, but this is one of my favorite ones just because it's such an amazing quote. It was an experiment to see how targeted advertising worked, like if it worked at all. And it says, in one experiment, they used six different advertising platforms in an effort to reach Australian men between the ages of 25 and 44. Their targeting performed slightly worse than random guessing. <laughs> slightly worse than random guessing. And we're ruining all of the content and all of the shared knowledge that we have for that, right? Pretty bad. And yeah, so P&G, Chase and Uber, three massive brands. They slashed their digital advertising, completely slashed it, almost to nothing. No perceivable change, negligible change in terms of their actual sales. Amazing. That's a, if that's not a bubble, I don't know what is. We should get together and try and short it. More on shorting in a bit. Um, so you think we'd try something else, but, we, but, it's, but it's an ideology, it's religion. People are still investing in this because there's nothing left. There's nothing else to invest in. We've chopped down all the trees. <laughs> so the very few people who do actually make some money for it, and they're like three companies, they'll keep trying to encourage us to, to advertise more and more, and they'll, they'll promise us more and more engagement with that advertising. And that search for engagement takes us to a very, very dark place. Let me just try and like break this down. Someone on social media says, the earth is flat. Now, that's going to get a lot of engagement. And it's not just going to be with people who agree with it, right? You're going to get people who just think, just tell them they're wrong, obviously. But you're going to get people who just think it's funny that they've said it, and then they have to go, this is funny. Like, that's redundant, but they'll do it anyway. You'll get people who do agree with it vehemently and say, oh, you're so brave to say this. Um, you know, you're saying, saying what everyone's thinking. <laughs> 
Um, and you'll get, you always get somebody who calls you a hypocrite, even when it's a complete non sequitur. <laughs> Someone always, oh, yeah, but that's hypocritical. Sorry, do you know what hypocritical means? In any case, if I were instead to just go, the earth is round, I wouldn't get really much engagement from that. I think most people would just be like, well, it's, do you think you're special, like making that point? And of course, the people who want to advertise with us are going to advertise among the bullshit content, the bad content, because that's where the engagement is. And it extends to obviously being hateful and discriminatory. And I'm using downhill skiers as an example because I, I don't really want to uh, touch on anything which might be sensitive to anyone, but also because I am a downhill skier, or I have been in the past. Downhill skiers are morons. Okay, so the kind of engagement you get, obviously, but, oh, that's hilarious that you said this. My, you're mad, you are. Yeah, brilliant. Um, someone will try and outdo them and say, well, I think you've forgotten figure skaters. They're also morons. Um, just trying to, like, match them in their level of bigotry. Then you'll get people who say that's ableist, like you're insulting them in the wrong way. And then you'll get people saying that skiing itself is ableist. And so they're trying to get one-upmanship on the person who's, you know, and it just turns into a whole thing. We've all been there. We've all been on Twitter. But the point is that it's loads of engagement. And what's tipping the balance isn't the people saying, yeah, bigotry's great. What's tipping the balance is the people saying, no, bigotry's bad. And you, every one of us, I'd like to think, their natural um, impulse is to say no when it comes to this stuff. But that makes these assholes money. <laughs> That's the problem. That's where we're stuck. I like to ski, not much engagement there. Um, I usually when someone says something innocuous like that, you think, well, I don't know what to say. So you just, you kind of just reiterate it to them, but just using emoji, so yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I get skiing, I'll just send you an emoji. Um, and of course the advertisers are going to gravitate towards the hateful stuff. If you are completely hateful in ways which, like this person, who I think you might recognize as, I think she's, an American senator now, or she's, she's certainly in government. She's anti-Semitic, she, she can't spell, she doesn't know how to use idioms, uh, and everything she says is conspiracy theory. That is such a high level of nonsense and horror that, uh, that they, that's elevated them to a place of, of power and influence. And that's a scary thing, it's like we've turned the world upside down. So fundamentally, the bad content is the profitable content, and that is what's wrong with society. Gap property for Flexbox, uh, uh, available in Edge, Chrome, Safari, Firefox, and Opera, so most of the major browsers. It's been there for a while, but I just, it just makes such a difference to how you, how you lay out content. It's, uh, it means that you don't have that leftover margin on the side, so when things wrap, things get asymmetrical and that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, yeah, I just, I'm just really into it. So capital plus engagement equals more capital, but only for the ad space sellers. So they're the, they're the, large, the large tech firms, essentially, um, who, who govern social media sites. No return on investment for advertisers, which is a big problem. The organization of global society around its shittest people and ideas is one of the externalities and a very serious externality that we're dealing with. Another externality worth just briefly mentioning is there's a lot of poorly paid or unpaid fascist content creators. And I'm not going to shed too many tears for them, but I just thought I'd throw that in anyway. This is all really complex. So let me just put it this way, okay? So trans people exist. They are human and they deserve human rights, obviously. Why are these simple truths increasingly framed as a debate? In no small part because fomenting a so-called culture war increases engagement which sells advertising space for adverts that don't fucking work and for products nobody wants to fucking buy. We are living at a time of a massive proliferation, I can't say that word, proliferation of hate because someone somewhere wants to sell you a spatula and you already own a fucking spatula. One product, one product massively outsells and that's because of trans people. I don't want to generalize, but every single trans person that I know owns more than 30 of these. <laughs> and uh, I've actually owned one for years, so I had a bit of a, a moment. <laughs> but um, yeah, um, so 
Shoshana Zuboff wrote this book called The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. And in it, she talks about the last virgin wood. And it's kind of a terrifying thing for me because the idea, I found it very poetic. She talks about capitalism and how it tries to colonize everything. So it starts, started by colonizing the planet, colonizing resources, you know, like invading countries and for oil. We talk about that sort of thing a lot. Um, but it colonizes our lives as well. It colonizes our working lives. Um, work isn't an inherently capitalist thing. There's absolutely no reason why you creating things and working on things should disproportionately make one or two people very, very rich. Like, there's no logic to that. Um, and it's increasingly colonizing our social lives and corrupting the way that we talk to each other. Because let's face it, all of our social interactions now are mediated by ad sellers. That's what social media is. And the last virgin word is the last thing that capitalism can take from us. And in uh, Shoshana's um, contention, that is, that is our inner selves, our, um, our personalities, our fears, our, our intimate inner experiences. And I disagree with the idea that, it, um, that they've been able to do that on a huge scale, as in they haven't been able to do that to everyone because not everyone is that impressionable. But there are a very few people who are extremely impressionable. And it's a question, using the vast amounts of data that is available um, through, through um, engagement with social media, the first thing that you need to do is identify those people. And those people have been found. Um, it's very easy to identify them. They have independent thinker written in their, in their bios. Um, and what has happened is that you, the thing is, you don't need to brainwash everyone. You don't need to be able to manipulate everyone. It only takes a few people to tip the balance. When it comes to propaganda, when it comes to political campaigns, that's all you need. So here's how shorting works. You start at the top here. You borrow stocks at a certain price, three billion pounds, let's say. Then you sell them as quickly as you possibly can. You might lose a little bit. So let's say 2.8 billion. Then what you depend on is them losing their value dramatically so that when it comes to buying them back so that you can give them back to the people you borrowed them from, you pocket the difference. And this is why Brexit happened, right? Because you needed, you, they wanted to destroy the pounds. That's the stocks we're talking about here. And the difference between that working and not working was how confident they were in being able to manipulate and brainwash just a few people, the people who are the swing voters, right? You won't have seen these adverts because you're not impressionable people, but when it comes down to it, you didn't really need to know that much about people to be able to manipulate them because it's all the, always the old stuff. The Brexit conversations, if you remember them now, because it was such a long time ago, I remember having these conversations and people would say, are you gonna vote for Brexit? And you'd go, well, no. And they'd go, why, like, are you like sexually inferior? And you'd go, like, what? well, no, obviously I'm gonna vote for Brexit. That's all you had to do to convince people. That was essentially it. So the final stage of capitalism that we're living through right now is disaster capitalism. And it's an interesting change from what we had before because not only is it just pumping up the value of things, it's actually destroying, deliberately destroying value. So the, the externality is no longer a side effect, it's actually the central thing, it's the point. People are deliberately ruining what we have in order to personally benefit. Um, yeah, so. A lot of people will say things like this, and they'll say, well, capitalism is good as long as you control it, but why, why would you want to control or diminish a good thing, right? I've always found that like a weird thing to say. What they really mean is capitalism is good so long as you reduce the exploitation part, okay? Now, I, I googled exploitation, and these are the three definitions of exploitation. One, the action of treating someone unfairly in order to benefit from their work, right? So that's, that's the, the original labor theory of value stuff. Two, the action of making use of and benefiting from resources. That's capitalism irresponsibly 
um, and unsustainably using the planet and our environment. And three, the fact of making use of a situation to gain unfair advantage for yourself. That's your scams. That's your making people vote against their own interests, the disaster capitalism stuff. Capitalism is just exploitation. That's all it is. And it is a fundamentally irredeemable thing, like cancer or James Corden. <laughs> so when they say this, what they mean is capitalism is good so long as you reduce the capitalism part, which is functionally similar, just speaking to the programmers in the room, to capitalism is bad. But you're not allowed to say that. And I'm not being, uh, I'm not trying to be kind of uh, overly dramatic. You literally aren't, or you're beginning not to be allowed to say that in this country. Teachers are now not allowed to present their students with um, material that is critical of capitalism in schools. Um, in fact, it is categorized alongside promoting criminality and terrorism. And you're not to know this, and I don't know, um, I don't know whether I can say this exactly, um, but there are people who are not allowed to see me make this talk. And <laughs> I find that kind of terrifying, not because I think that it's going to put me in personal danger, but because that's we've, where we are now. That's, that's what we're dealing with here in this country, where freedom of speech is valued so long as you use it to be shit towards trans people or Romani gypsies. And teachers are bound to do this, bound to tell children, you have to believe this, you, the pies can just get bigger, <laughs> which is just religion. And I'm, I'm a secularist, which means I believe people should practice religion, but I don't think it should be taught in schools. So I don't think Christianity should be taught in schools, and I don't think capitalism should be taught in schools either. Um, this part of the talk is really difficult because I've spent a long time obsessing over this. I don't do very many talks these days, and obviously I wanted to create something actionable at the end, but I think that would be trite, and I think that um, it would be like selling you something, and I don't want to be that person right now. Not that it's bad to sell things, and you don't have to sell them in a capitalist way. Um, so I'm just going to leave you with just one small comfort, which is this. CSS container queries <laughs> are now available in the following browsers, Chrome, Edge, and Safari, and, you know, uh, design systems, modularity, things like that. Where's Remy? <laughs> <laughs>